live a life of service. My dad always told me, live a life of service. Don't leave this world and, and who cares about your purse? Nobody cares about your car. They don't care how cute you look. They care about what you did to change the world. So I'm trying to
just overcoming obstacles to achieve whatever those dreams are that you have uh, inside of you. I grew up in Mississippi, single parent home. Um, I was the youngest of six kids, but they all were much, much older than me, so I basically grew up like the, um, like the only child. I did not meet my biological father until I was 18 years old, even though I had known this, I knew this man my whole life, I just didn't know him as my father. And um, I was introduced to basketball at the age of like eight, and um, started playing during the summers. And my little coach told me later on that I was going to the worst vacations. We weren't doing those things, but I got to do that because of basketball. So I, I was exposed to all of these different um, opportunities uh, because of, of my ability to play. And I ended up going to Ole Miss, University of Mississippi, on a full basketball scholarship. I mean, I was high school, All-American, like ranked nationally as like the number 15 player in the country. And, I mean, just really highly recruited, but I could have gone anywhere. But I chose to stay close to home. And um, at 18, I had a knee surgery, knee injury, first time I'd ever been uh, injured. And after the surgery, the doctor comes into the uh, comes into the room and tells me that I have something called degenerative arthritis. And I had no idea what it was, what it meant, or anything like that. He said, "Well, what that means is that um, you know your knees, like the bones and all this other stuff, is just naturally deteriorating. Like it's nothing that you can do. It's like you're 18, but you have the knees of like an 80 year old person, and you keep playing basketball." By the time you're 30, you're not going to be able to walk. But this was all I had, so there was no, that wasn't an option. Like, me not going to college to play basketball, like, that wasn't an option because the, the alternative was we grew up, I grew up on a farm. So that was the alternative, be a farmer or a basketball. I don't feel I don't feel So I was like, okay, we're going to have to ride this thing around. So um, after that, a couple months after that, I found that I was pregnant at 18. And I just thought, Pretty much that, that was it. That was my world was over because uh, my mother she couldn't. I mean, we weren't living in a life of luxury. You know, we were. She was. She struggled to get me to that point. Um, and I thought I was going to lose my scholarship. But obviously, I did. Um, thank God, I had a, a really supportive family. My mother made me promise her that if I stayed in school and graduated, that she would help me with my child. And I really, when I called her to tell her that I was pregnant, I was like, she's like, well, you know what? There's nothing we can do about it. You know, at this point, um, but I do need you to make me this one promise. I was like, oh God, I'm 18. She wants me not to have sex. And he was like, what? You know, she's like, no, I just want you to promise that you're going to graduate from college. Like, just make that promise. So I did, you know, and I went on and, and throughout my college career, you know, I did well. It was all SEC and all American, all that stuff, but I had three knee surgeries uh, from the time I was a freshman to senior year, and then I was, um, I got pregnant my senior year of college, like at the end of my senior year. And so that was in 96, and the WNBA was coming about in 97. And my coach, Coach Chancellor, uh, he had been my college coach for four years. And so he um, had gotten a job as the head coach of the Houston Commons, and he was the general manager. So I just thought, yeah, okay, it's about to be on. And then, you know, I'm just thinking I'm going to walk right into a position that man told me, you know, um, you're not good enough to make to play professional basketball. This is the same man that I just pretty much would run through a wall for, um, not even just a few months ago. So he told me, he tells me, he says, you know, you're not tall enough at your position to be able to compete. And I'm like, well, these are going to be the same women that I just finished playing against. So ain't nobody growing. I mean, I'm still going to be the same height. So what's the difference? And so it's, I mean, and his last thing to me was, you know, Yolanda, you got to have a snowball's chance in hell on my team, is what he told me. And so that was two days before the tryout. And that was Houston. I had family in Dallas. So to me, it's like that was my only option because I needed help with my kids. So Dallas, Houston, where I was playing. So that was the only team that I had that I was going to try out for. So I went down there, and there were women from all over the world. Everybody's trying to live out there who dream. Everybody wanted to be Michael Jordan. Um, even girls, because that's all we had. And so the WBA, so there were people. Everybody going after the same thing. And so there were only four spots. There were about 250 women there competing for four spots, for one of, you know, one of the four remaining spots. And um, lo and behold, me with my bad knees and him with his uh, lack of encouragement, to say the least, I went down there and I was able to earn one of those uh, one of those spots. It went on to make history, being part of the first ever WBA championship team in 97, and then winning the second championship in 1998. I grew up in New Jersey, and my older sister is a four-time Olympian. 
and she's, yeah, she's got amazing accolades. My older brother was a great athlete. And um, I said, I'm not doing what they do. I'm not trying to follow their footsteps. I don't want to be prepared. And it doesn't look like fun. They're sweating. It's cold. <laughs> not right out there. This is stupid. I'm going to try everything else. So I tried drama. It was okay. You know, I did pretty well. I tried tennis. Uh, not really. Basketball, fail. Horseback riding. I mean, I tried every sport. And um, at a certain point, I even did figure skating. Um, was my turn. <laughs> I went up in the air and I came down and when I woke up I was unconscious in the hospital. I, had, I still have a scar. I came down on my face and my dad said, look, enough of the games. Like, and just to give you a background on my family, my father is um, Joe Pratt from the movie Lean On Me. So he does not play games. And he was like, uh, he used some words I didn't understand. He was like, you're going to start running track expeditiously. I'm like, oh, okay. All right. So, <laughs> so you know, I started um, running very late, actually, at 16 years old. And um, I had pretty immediate success. Um, I was ranked number one in the nation immediately. I think it was in my blood. And I had been kind of hiding from it. And um, I started feeling the pressure for a few reasons. Because my father at the time was such a big name. We were going to movie premieres. and. Um, people were saying that's Joe Clinton's daughter, so they had that pressure. And then she comparing me to my sister Joetta, oh, that's her younger sister. What is she gonna do? I didn't handle it well. I was winning, but I would run out of fear. So I would go to the front and I would just run away from everybody and I would win, but at the end I just felt mentally taxed and I never felt happy. I would wave and act like I was happy, but inside I was like, Phew. I didn't let the family down, I don't have to hear my dad's big words, you know, and everybody <laughs> song about me. And um, I carried that for many years. So I, I went to college on a full scholarship. When I got there, I continued to do the same thing. I was winning, I was undefeated in college, um, but never feeling really happy, really uh, satisfied. And, um, and um, at the end of college, I, I didn't even think of a professional career, but Nike and Adidas both um, approached me, um, kind of were going back and forth about who's gonna sponsor me. A lot of people don't know, um, for you that have especially young um, children, Track and field is a professional sport, and I make my entire living off of track and field. So, you know, um, I chose to go with Nike, and I signed a deal with them that took me until just last year, so I'm 35 now. So from 21 to 34, I was full-time Nike athlete. So uh, I enjoyed that very much. Uh, started competing for them, and coming out of college, it was my first Olympic game. So going into it, they started calling us the Clark sisters. Um, my sister, my sister-in-law, me. Three of us were all fighting for spots in the same in the same event at the Olympics. They put it in Jeff magazine. Are the Clark sisters going to do it? They put it in the newspaper, and I was scared again. I said, "Great, you know." And they were saying the young one. We were not too sure about her. She was 21 years old. I thought it was a girl off the line. But I said, "God, you know, give me. I can't do this." I thought about walking off the line and just going and crying somewhere. I didn't want to do it. And um, I don't remember what happened in the race. I think God took over. Um, next thing I knew, I won. I, I just remember finishing, and my mom was jumping up and down saying, Good job, Peachy. Everyone calls me Peachy. And, I, and people were shocked because they didn't even know if I was going to make the team. And we swept all three spots. So we made history as a family. Um, my sister, my sister in law, and they three women. So um, that was probably the most amazing athletic achievement that, achievement that I've had because for a family to come together and do that is very difficult. Um, we sacrificed together, we had to put our ego to the side, we had to support each other as a team, and there's only three spots in the whole country and they went to my family, so I'm very proud of that. Um, so I went out to the um, Olympics, uh, my sister and sister-in-law didn't make the finals. Uh, I watched them go and qualify around before me and it got eliminated and I said, oh, I have no chance. Okay, I'm the younger sister, they didn't do it. But once again, I just tried to push that to the back of my head, I said, God, help me make this final. Um, I made the final. I was the only American to do that for a very long time, so that was exciting as well. Um, when I got in the final, um, I just went for it. And uh, I got too excited, went out too hard, I was in second. And um, I wanted to win so bad that I punched it. And uh, right going to the end, there were six athletes together, and I went from sixth to fifth place. I was all leaning across the line. So I was disappointed, I was crying. And I was just, oh God, I mean, I ran the best race of my life, but I didn't get a medal. I didn't get a medal. Everyone wants a medal. And I'll never forget that my mom said, uh, I know you didn't get a medal. You're disappointed, but you have the gold medal of life. I'm so proud of you. Mm -hmm. You worked hard. You went out there and 
seen you know, all you can see that you've represented your family and you know you've taken your academics seriously and that's what I'm about. So you have the gold medal, right? Like, everybody can't win a medal. And I thought about that. And I said, I'm gonna tell kids that because mm -hmm. yeah. so many times we just focus on gold, gold, gold. Everyone can't get the gold. But we have to understand that sometimes going up and giving your best and doing it without using drugs and steroids, you know about steroids and all that. Being a clean athlete and you know living the life the way you should live your life, your life and giving back to others. I've been very blessed. Um, Nike has used me as a spokesperson. It's opened doors for me. I've been able to travel the world. Uh, and um, I do want to, to urge all parents to expose their children. My parents exposed me even before I started running. They would send me to camps. Um, when my father got the money from the movie, he invested in each of his children and put us in camps we didn't want to go to. And I was angry. I don't want to go to science camp. You're going to science camp. <laughs> okay, you know, but it's paying off now. You know, people tell me a lot of time your vocab, you know, is great. I mean, just the way you speak and the way you carry yourself opens doors. People judge you sometimes on the things that you say. You only get two minutes sometimes to make a first impression. So um, I thank my parents for exposing me, even though I really was not happy about that. And I just want us to you know, do the same thing for our children. And uh, that's basically my story. I'm happy to be here with you. When I come to events like this, um, it really does empower me. Because as soon as I walk in the door, you know, people try to talk about women and say, we're catty, we don't support each other, we hate. It's not true. I can feel everyone in this room, um, everybody was singing, everybody was happy. And there's so much talent in this room, and we're here to support each other. We have to you know, continue to do that. So I'm glad to be here to talk with you and share that with you. So thank you. Our encouragement, like we, we just hold so much power as women because of the way that we were innately created. And I just, when, when you're going through things, just if you can just remember that. Like if you just need something to hold on to, just remember that you, you already have that power. You have the power to create the solution to whatever situation that you're in. The fact that you are encountering a problem lets you know that there is a solution because there is an opposite to everything. It's an up, it's a down, it's an in, it's an out. So you you have the power to create that, you know, to create whatever environment, whatever whatever world it is that you want. I don't want to monopolize. Sorry. <laughs> um, my brother is a principal, and I'm very proud of him, and there's a running joke in our family that I call him Joe Clark. So this is just like really like a situation for me that he's still sitting here at his daughter, because this man will cancel homecoming. He comes to prom. He's not having it. It's just that we need to focus and we need to get this education. So it's really awesome. And you're here and I need to go back home and tell him that. That's what I'm saying. So at any point, what point did you stop being afraid? Oh, you owned it. And you were free from that fear. What was that moment? If you hear it. I'll be honest with you, I still have a little bit of that fear. I kind of wake up every day and just want to measure up to what I'm expecting myself to be for a few reasons. First of all, my parents did give me everything possible to see. You know, I have no reason to feel I can't say that they didn't expose me to anything. I can't say I didn't go to the best school. They sacrificed for me, so I feel a certain pressure on my shoulders every morning when I wake up that I want to get to where I think that I should be. Um, I've learned to see it as more of a positive. I actually had to talk to someone about it. They said, do you realize that it's a negative goal when you say, I don't want to embarrass my family, I don't want to let my father down. So I turned it around to, um, I want to be what I know I can be, what my parents raised me to be, what God has put me on this earth to be. And I found also, um, I do a lot of community service. I'm a spokesperson for Special Olympics now. And when I live a life of service, my dad always told me, live a life of service. Don't leave this world, and, and who cares about your purse? Nobody cares about your car. They don't care how cute you look. They care about what you did to change the world. So I'm trying to do that. And my father has done that. Um, when I go places and people talk about how my father's touched them or the movie or the things that he's done to some of the students, it makes me realize what he's saying. When he leaves his world, people will remember what he did. Um, and I want to be the same way. Um, it's not about winning medals or anything like that. It's about did I change a child's life? Did I help someone in need? You know, And um, that's what I'm working on. So. Right. Nobody wants to sacrifice the things that are meaningful to the community or long term for their legacy for their family. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so I'm that chick and I'm like, okay, I'm asking certain people, key people that I know, okay, let's partner up and do this. Okay. 
<laughs> and then it's like, I'm the one that's always having the courage. I'm the one that's always having the call and say, can we get this done? And I'm just like, I'm tired of that. I'm like, if you don't want to do it, I'm not having that conversation. You look up one day and it's done. Don't be like, well, Kim, I thought, mm -mm. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm over that. So am I wrong with that? <laughs> Everybody wants to show that they got the better car mm -hmm. and the better rims and the fly, fly jewelry or whatever, the fly house. But if we came together, um, I think obviously we'd be more successful as a community. And uh, that's one thing I do like about Atlanta. I do think there are a lot of more young, I've met personally, a lot of more young, female, black, progressive um, business owners. And that's an inspiration to me. I'm part owner of a business here, a production studio. When I tell you, Finding people that want to work the way I, my work ethic is and support me and do the right things. And it's been really difficult for me to the point where I had to close my doors and search to find those type, types of people. Um, so I understand what you mean. Uh, 
I'm the author of Black Boogeyman. I'm writing this. I was an anal well, I, I will always be a scientist. I'm an analytical protein biochemist. So, uh, multifaceted, I guess I would say. Question. Let's say you have a young man that grows up in the hood, you know, uh, uh, the bricks per se. But he does all the right things. He gets a good education with some substance. He, uh, graduates, uh, he gets a good job, <laughs> but he still lives in the hood, okay, and becomes somewhat successful. What's the first thing that you're going to You're on camera now, so... <laughs> You said after he becomes successful, so he graduated college and everything? Yes, indeed. Probably starts his own business or something. Well, before that, and I... That, that is Start building the family. Before that, what we do... What we we take, make up a deal? I'm going to give it to you. What we tend to do is young, young adults who work in the hood, once we become successful, we leave. We leave the hood. You know, in turn, the inner city stays pretty dilapidated because it's void of great people like you and I. You know what I mean? We leave once we become successful. So it turns out boys and girls rarely see great people. So anyway, what my book is about is a really charismatic leader that goes off into the suburbs. And he, he grabs all these great men and he brings them into the worst parts of the inner city to live. Not to visit, but to live. And what these men do, they form a covert group called the Black Boogie Men. And so what they do, they change the inner city by first affecting the aesthetics, meaning they beautify the surrounding area. Then they began to revamp the educational system, making it more conducive to the young urban thinking process. And uh, because we're American and we all love, you know, gratuitous gore, gratuitous violence and action, uh, they began to get rid of uh, the gangbangers and drug dealers. They even forced our young boys to pull their damn pants up. So Subsequently, they convert the inner city into something comparable to a utopian society. But rich folk are fighting to get into areas they usually wouldn't have there. So, and one thing I can tell you is no one likes this book. Everyone loves it. Everyone loves it. What area was it based on? Well, I'm from St. Louis. So, uh, it starts in St. Louis, but it eventually cascades throughout the uh, entire uh, country. And I can tell you everybody loves it. Everybody's kind of ready for it, too. So, I think that's why it's... Uh, life coaching. Okay. I'm a self-mastery coach. <laughs> working with women. Okay. To bring out their beauty and their elegance and their alignment so they will know who they are in this life and personal power and wisdom and understanding and breaking through those boundaries. Okay. That's who I am. That's what I do. Where can I find your information? RaiseYourselfCoaching.com Jet Correa. Find it on Facebook too. Okay. Raise yourself a coaching. Alright, you look beautiful. Gorgeous. Thank when, you. When, when yes, yes, it is gorgeous. It's Absolutely gorgeous. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh, oh.